All right, everybody, I'm Rich Fowler. You're watching PBS Books coverage of AWP 2018. It continues. I'm with Tayimba Jess, who is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Olio. Congratulations on the Pulitzer, first Thank of all. You. That's Thank a pretty you. amazing thing to add to your roster, your, your resume. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. The book is incredible. The book is a collection of poems, certainly. It's also, though, uh, a work of art. It is um, a, a dedication to um, performers of yesteryear between the Civil War and World War I, which we'll talk about quite a bit. But just in the way that it's constructed and put together and all of that put in so much thought on your side. What a, what a wonderful book. Thank you. Yeah, Thank let's, you. Let's talk about First, if you wouldn't mind, just about the general theme of this book, and and right. you you start off the entire thing first of all with the with the definition of what olio is. Right. And we should probably start right there. That's a great place to start. Um, olio means a mix of melange of ingredients uh, that go into a meal. In the context of American theater, it's the middle part of a minstrel show where a variety of acts would appear. So you could have a juggler, a dancer, a singer, a dancer, a singer, a comedian, etc. And uh, the Olio was, was that central part of the minstrel show, which, uh, which later on in the 20th century, kind of when the minstrel show uh, kind of died off, the Olio became the basis for vaudeville. Yeah, and, and what you see too, that you give a cast of characters in here, some amazing yes. human beings that, I'm not sure how well you knew them before you started this book, but this is a, a group of people that were part of these shows or that were right. performers and, and, and writers and people that came out of the African-American right. well, the book world. Is, the book is about uh, African-American creatives, performers uh, who were uh, seeking a creative path directly after the Civil War, sometimes before the Civil War, right after the Civil War, and up until World War I. It's about the, talking about the first generation of newly freed black folks who were seeking a creative path. and. They, it, in that context, they become their own olio. They were working against, through, and um, uh, uh, trying to subvert the idea of the, of the minstrel show in, in, on many occasions. And they, a lot of them uh, made their livings this way and then yeah. somehow found a way through it all. Like you see people who want to maybe judge people who were part of some of these shows back then and yet they were, their creativity, their creative side broke through this, this right. period of time. It's, mm -hmm. There's a conflict there, though. Well, you know, um, uh, Burt Williams and George Walker were actually in the minstrel show. Uh, the other folks that in the book, there's Sissy Retta Jones, who was the first uh, black performer and uh, black singer in Carnegie Hall. There's uh, uh, Edmonia Lewis, uh, the, the most successful African-American uh, um, uh, visual artist of the 19th century. She had $50,000 commissions uh, back in the 1880s. There's uh, uh, Henry Box Brown, who not only escaped from slavery from Virginia to Philadelphia in a box, but later on went to England and uh, became a, a performance artist and, and reenacted uh, the slave trade and, and his own escape and later on became a mesmerist. There's the McCoy twins, who were uh, conjoined twins, who could uh, speak multiple languages, play instruments, uh, dance, sing. They were a huge hit at, 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 towards the end of the 19th century. There's uh, Blind Tom, who was uh, blind and autistic, owned by the same family uh, throughout his entire life, up until his death, until 19, early, early 20th century. Blind Boone, who was a, a, uh, um, a fantastic ragtime musician, who was very, very famous uh, at the end of the 19th century. Of course, Scott Joplin, the Fisk Jubilee Singers, who uh, took the spiritual and spread it all around the country, then spread it all around the globe at a time when most people hadn't heard the sound of free black voices. Scott Joplin was, was the, it's considered the father of ragtime. Well, so there's many, many people in it. And it's, yeah, it's, and some of you might, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and people you may have heard of, right. or Scott Joplin, but mm -hmm. then there's somebody for me that I was fascinated by, Ernest, right. Rogan, or Ernest Hogan, who right. um, was mm -hmm. maybe even created ragtime before Scott Joplin right. with, with his song, but it was, all coons look alike to me. And it right. was like he basically created the sound, the syncopated mm -hmm. rhythm that he found. Well, er er Ernest Hogan was responsible for, uh, uh, for the development of, of the coon song, which is a real, uh, was a whole genre of music that was tied to ragtime. It was like putting lyrics to, to ragtime music. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a forgotten but critical part of the development of American music. And um, it, it also, you know, when I, when I talk about the minstrel show, I talk about it 
and I, I think of it in, in terms of it, uh, it being a kind of psychological warfare uh, against black people in this country. And these, these folks, Ernest Hogan took, took a, a, a role as a, as a kind of uh, uh, purveyor of, the, of, that, of that imagery. And uh, he did it for financial gain. And, I, and he had, a, had mixed uh, emotions about that, about his participation in that, in that enterprise. Um, and there were also folks that, that resisted and gave, this, gave, this, uh, gave the minstrel show or the idea of minstrelsy, put it in, in a different kind of context. And that's what, kind of what I wanted to do, is to go into this book, go into these folks, and explore these fascinating lives that happened right after the Civil War up until World War I. What did the idea... you the development of ragtime and jazz and spirituals. Was it music? Where did the idea come from? Where did it start, this idea of putting all this together for you? Right. Well, my first book was about Lead Belly, and Lead Belly was born in 1885, died in 1949. Uh, and what I, he made me curious about the development of black music. What usually when we think about music, when you think about black music in particular, we're, think, we're thinking about the music that we've heard. And these folks, there's only one person in this book that was actually recorded, you know, audio recorded, and that would be Burr Williams. The rest of them were never recorded. And they, but they were still making a contribution to the sound. They were de developing the sound of black music right, ap right after the Civil War up until World War I. And I, I, I think that's, that's a fascinating story. It bugged me that I did not know them. many of their stories and I did not know um, uh, their music as well. And so that was one of the driving factors in get, getting through the book. So right. we, uh, we talked earlier about the, this book is put together in a way that's very visual, um, yeah. whether it's illustrations, whether it's uh, pages that you can literally, you're encouraged to just rip out. And, yes. Um, you know, that, that tell the story. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the black victims of lynchings for 10,000 blacks by a state. Right. And on the back is a poem that I know that if you it's a dialogue that on the back of that on, on the back of that table of lynchings uh, from the uh, from the 19th century up until the uh, up, up until the 20th is a dialogue between Booker T. Washington and Paul Lawrence Dunbar, with uh, really it's kind of taking the idea of the of the golden shovel which Terrence Hayes developed uh, off of uh, Gwendolyn Brooks another right there you off go. of Gwendolyn Brooks famous poem. And it, 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 it manipulates that, that, that poem into a dialogue between Booker T. Washington and Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And you can tear it out of the, out of the book. And there's, also, there's four fold outs, and I'm just going to do this right here, yeah, yeah. that tear out of the book as such, right? And enable the, the reader to read back and forth. Where's the camera? Back and forth, down and up, diagonally and going all around, and also for the, the right side to read into the left side. And so, so that, what that enables you to do is to experience the kind of conundrum, the kind of uh, twisting of language, and the, the, uh, the kind of paradox of coming from one state into another. In this case, in, in this case with, the, with Burt Williams and George Walker, they were going from the minstrel show and from that, from that, their participation in this very two-dimensional depiction of, of black folks, we're able to create characters with depth. And because they created characters with depth, that added dimensionality to their performance. They were, so, and they were also responsible for some of the very first uh, independent uh, African-American theater productions in the country. So in that case, what you do is, to, to experience that creation of depth, you go from a two-dimensional plane into a three-dimensional construct, such as a cylinder that can be read around and around and up and down, going all the way around all, uh, continuously. And then that also continues from the top to the bottom. So that's another cylinder going from a two-dimensional structure into a three-dimensional structure. And then when you finally take those elements and combine them, you end up with uh, a mathematical construction that is a, called a torus that is basically a donut that can be read, this poem can be read all the way around inside, backwards and forwards, all the way around on the outside, backwards and forwards. I'm talking line by line, backwards and forwards. And then from side to side, backwards and forwards. And then when you take it and give it a final twist, 
that is a Mobius strip, and that is a true paradox. Okay, so that's 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 the 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 idea behind deconstructing the book in which, order to which you reconstruct the history. I mean, here we are history. holding pages of your book you in go. our hands, there you and go. that level of thought and detail into how you wanted this to be considered, read, right. played with, right. thought of. Yes, is a multi-dimensional, multi-layered approach that must have taken so much longer and the right kind of publisher who can yeah. understand the needs of a book like this. Uh, hats off to Wave. Uh, the folks at Wave, you know, really stretched the limits with this book. And really part of what, what the book is about, it's about the, the, the human connection to the printed page. You know, it's, this, is, this is old technology, but it's great technology. And, you know, I've, I, and, and reading poetry on screen and electronically is not the same thing as reading it and, ha and having it tangibly in front of you. And what th this is... What part of this is an exercise in the, the physical nature of a book and the way, the way a book can communicate with the reader? So uh, what if, what, as you've given talks about this book and sat down with younger people with this book or anybody and, and walked through that cylindrical right. mm -hmm. presentation right. and played around with the paper and it's like almost like origami or something. I right. mean, what sort of responses do you get to when you, you show them how this can be played with on so many different levels? Uh, you know, I think, I think the thing, the thing people are intrigued by the idea that the reader has a different kind of agency and that they don't have to, it's not just from left to right and down, and that they can choose their path through these various poems. And I think, you know, on, on another level, I think that there's an element of exploration and, and, and play, so to speak, that, that comes into the, the interrogation of the text in that, in that in that way, and, and people like it. People, people like, you know, being able to 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 have different different avenues and different uh, ways of exploring exploring the text. So yeah. it's fun, especially with kids, you know. So the research part of this book, immense oh, yeah. amount of research. You said earlier yeah. that you felt bad that you didn't know some of these stories. I did. So when you dove in and started discovering this, when did you realize who was going to make their way into this book? And when you had found somebody that you're like, my God, this is an amazing story. That's, that's a great question, because you know what? I, in going through the history, basically, I, there's a bibliography in the back of the book, which uh, details many of the books that I, that I encountered in trying to dig up this research. The research and the writing took about seven years. Um, research, write, research, write, research, write, back and forth and back and forth. And, and then at the, at, uh, at the end of the process, you know, I'm forgetting what your question was. Oh, just, just <laughs> like how you would find, how would you determine these people have to right. be in my book? I mean, this There were some people that didn't incredible. make it in the book because I wasn't able to capture their, their story in the exact right way. But these people that made it in the book, I was, I was able to get at their story, research them appropriately. I think, and, uh, and find a way to, to bring them in the book and, do, and try my best to do justice by the history, by their histories and, and by their ambitions. And it's, it was written in communication with the folks that are in the book, you know? Yeah. I feel like it, it, there is a lot of dialogue across history and across generations and with them uh, in, in the creation of the poems in the book. One of them was the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Yeah. Can you tell uh -huh. us about their story? It's an amazing thing as you're reading these, the stories, the way you present them in here. The Fisk Jubilee Singers uh, were essentially, they were, they were college age youngsters. Traveling around the country. Who, yeah, who were seeking their education directly after the Civil War, which like thousands and thousands and thousands of black folks were flocking to schools to get, the, get their education, get something that was deprived of them under the years of slavery, you know, you, if reading was uh, punishable by whipping and death. So they were flocking, folks were flocking to schools. These folks flocked to Fisk University, which was established in 1867. By 1871, uh, there was a cadre of, of students that would go to their cabins and sing the songs that their grandmothers and their grandfathers the and their mothers and fathers had, had sung to get them through the hard times of slavery. Uh, one of their instructors heard them and took them around the country and then around the world, spreading the, wor the, the idea of the spiritual and the, and they, the they sound for of free black President music. Ulysses S. Grant, they performed for world leaders, they traveled yes. around the planet. Yes, they did. And, and so the, there's, a, there's a crown of sonnets 
it goes throughout the book and it and it it talks about the lot each one uh, the book is written in mostly in persona so each one takes a group persona or the personas of the individual first folks and and I, at the top and the bottom of every sonnet in the fist jubilee crown of sonnets is uh uh Another history that's attended to this, the history of spirituals in America, and that's the history of the burning of black churches in America. So what I did was I looked up as many names of black churches that had been burnt to the ground or assaulted, and I put them at the top and the bottom of these, these, uh, these, these poems. And actually, this very first poem that's mentioned here became the very last poem. I mean, the very first church that is mentioned here is became the very last church because it was Mother Emanuel AME Church in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, which, is which was attacked, as you know, in 2015. But I, I, it was also burnt to the ground in 1822 because uh, uh, the church of Denmark Vesey. So, so I'm gonna read I'll this read, poem? Yeah, I'd, I'd I would love, love it to. if you would. Uh, and I, I'd like to say it's dedicated to Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, 1862, to uh, Cross Ankle Church in Palmetto, Georgia, 1899, Greenleaf Presbyterian Church, Keeling, Tennessee, 1900, Red Top Ch Church in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, 1915, First Baptist Church in Carteret, New Jersey, 1926, Fulton Street Methodist Church, Chicago, Illinois, 1927, Second Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan, my hometown, 1930, Macedonia Baptist Church in Egg Harbor City, New Jersey, Jersey 1936, Mount Methodist Church in, in uh, Henderson, North Carolina, 1940, and Negro Methodist Church in Loganville, Georgia, burnt to the ground in 1947. Fish Jubilee Proclamation with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, epigraph, O sing unto the Lord a new song. O sing. Undo the world with blue song born from newly free throats. Sprung loose from lungs once bound within bonded skin. Scored from dawn to dusk with coffle and lash. Every tongue unfurled as the body's flag. Every breath conjured despite loss we've had. Bear witness to the birthing of our hymn from story depths of America's sin. Soul-worn psalms blessed in our blood through dark lessons of the past struggling to be heard. Behold. The bold sound we found in ourselves that was hidden, cast out of the garden of freedom. It's loud and unbeaten, then soft as a newborn's face. Each note bursting loose from human bondage. Wow. It's pretty powerful stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very, very um, powerful to hear you read it, but also to hear the churches that you talk about beforehand. There was 148 that, that I was able to find the names of uh, that had been burnt throughout the, the course of American history. They're listed chronologically throughout the book. Yeah. So you, you've, you've taken on these lives, these people that have now become a part of you. You've learned so much about them. They've become both a responsibility to some degree and a burden. There's this idea of this like idea of reconciliation to some degree that you right. brought to the forefront here. How do you move on to another work when you, these people are with you now? They're a part of who you are. You, you've brought them to us. You can't uh, leave them behind. This, these people are now Well, in you the know, world. I'm, I'm always traveling with them. And I think in the process of writing the book, it became like traveling with a family of, of folks. And I think that uh, I, I've, I ran across so many stories that I couldn't even fit in this particular book. And those stories are waiting to be to be told and, and listened to and, and, ex and explored as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I've um, traveled with them. I'm still traveling with them. And I, now I'm going to travel with some more folks along the way. All right, my, I, I know we have to run in a sec, but I'm, I'm curious as you think about the role the poetry can play, especially the, the role of bringing history to life, bringing the world we live in to life, some of the young people you talk to, the role poetry can play right now to, to kind of, enthuse people, especially in thinking about the sort of physical element of the written word, too? You know, um, I, I see poetry as a refuge of resilience and resistance. And um, I see the, the act of writing a poem, the act of, the act of uh, creativity embodied in, in, the, in writing a poem, 
is a is a um, is an act of liberation, and I and I I constantly see that in my context. In that few generations back, I would not be able to you know access these words and 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 deliver them into the world and, and with breath and with with print. So um, I I I see poetry as as uh, as fundamental to the to the human condition as breathing. And uh, we need to have both in order to keep surviving. Well, thank goodness for that. Thank you. Yeah, Tayimba Jess, 2017 Pulitzer Prize winner, Olio. Thank Such you. Such an amazing work. And I appreciate you sharing with us today here on PBS Bookset. Amazing stuff. Thank you for bringing me here. All right, thank you. Absolutely. All right.